Well, it's not quite as bad as when we took a week off during the week of January 6th. And it's not quite as bad as the time that Elon Musk called a heroic rescue diver a pedophile. But we did take the day off to go to Disneyland on the same day that Elon Musk decided to get into a Twitter fight with Haraldur Thorleifsson. Elliot had a good time, by the way. Uh, despite what he may look like on camera, he had a, it was a joyful experience. I quite experience. enjoyed myself. Yeah. But yeah, at this point, you would think that the lines would be pretty clearly drawn. Some people like Elon Musk. Some people don't. Mm -hmm. And... That's that. But somehow, <laughs> Elon managed to do something this week that finally made even some of the simps who've been ride or die up till this point stop and wonder if uh, maybe, just maybe, the man that they've been idolizing all these years is in fact a tremendous asshole. Yeah, yeah. So let's start at the beginning. On Monday, Twitter user I am Harlder, display name Holly, wrote, Dear at Elon Musk, nine days ago, the access to my work computer was cut, along with about 200 other Twitter employees. However, your head of HR is not able to confirm if I am an employee or not. You've not answered my emails. Maybe if enough people retweet, you'll answer me here. So, you know, based on everything in that tweet, this person was working for Twitter, suddenly lost access, but was never given an actual notice of termination and has exhausted all other options for getting an answer about it. It seems like the kind of thing where if you are Elon Musk or anyone who's still left behind the scenes at Twitter, you forward, you forward this to HR and you have them handle it like they should have already, but you light a fire, you say, hey, let's take this offline. We have an employee who d d really has no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, can you reach out to them? Something, you, yeah, you want to put a lid on this. <laughs> That's how it would work at a normal company because, you know, when you fire someone, there actually are laws in place that require actually notifying employees they've been fired and sorting out, you know, all the other, you know, stock or anything. That it happened, their contracts, you know. It's a process. Yeah, you don't just unplug their machines and uh, let them figure it out for <laughs> the, themselves. The office space method of we fixed the glitch. Yeah, uh, they're, the, they're not getting paychecks and their computer doesn't work. There are labor laws and they exist. Uh, a lot of them, you're like, why does this exist? It's for situations like this. Yeah. But yeah, Twitter is not a normal company. So Elon replied directly to that tweet above with, what work have you been doing? Which is kind of a weird question, considering you literally own and run the company and can simply run this guy's name through your HR roster or whatever, uh, instead of conduct what appears to be an exit interview over Twitter. <sighs> but okay, uh, Halley replied to Elon saying that he can't actually answer that question due to NDAs that he signed. But uh, Elon told him to disregard that and just describe your job. That was, it was weird too, because... It was kind of set up to be like, watch, I'm going to get this guy to break yeah. his NDAs, and then we're all good. No, <laughs> no legal uh, ramifications Damn it, he for didn't old fall Musk. For it. Uh, Holly listed off his various job duties, to which Elon replied skeptically, uh, to put it mildly. At one point, he literally used the phrase, picks or it didn't happen, <laughs> to cast doubt on one of the things that Holly said he did at Twitter. You are the CEO, sir. You yeah. can check. You can check yes. on these things. Uh, at another point, he posted the clip from Office Space of the two downsizing consultants asking Mil Milton what exactly he does. Those are the good guys in the movie, right? <laughs> They're the heroes, protagonists. <laughs> Maybe watch that again. Uh, at another point, when Holly listed Figma as the SAAS contract he'd been working on lowering the cost of, uh, Elon replied with those crying laughing emojis he loves, which some took as an indication that Elon thought this was a Ligma joke and not a reference to a widely used SAS tool. Yeah, it was a very weird response. Like, okay, which SAS tool did you work on? It's like Figma, and then like laugh and what? Ha <laughs> just like Ligma, yeah, Sigma. Good one, good one, but yeah. like, but really answer the question. So yeah, just a very weird conversation between the CEO of a company and a person who simply wants to know whether they are still employed or not at that company and has decided to reach out via Twitter because they know that the CEO spends an absurd amount of time on there mm -hmm. and is more likely to notice their communications than uh, via email, via phone, any of that other stuff. Yes. So eventually Elon tweeted, the reality is that this guy, who is independently wealthy, did no actual work, claimed as his excuse that he had a disability that prevented him from typing, yet was simultaneously tweeting up a storm. Can't say I have a lot of respect for that. Uh, and then when one of Elon's biggest simps gently suggested that he maybe shouldn't shit on former employees in public, yeah. sir, please, uh, Elon replied, He's the worst. Sorry. The worst. Ugh. Which, uh, first of all, so half of the accusations in that first tweet could be directed accurately at Elon Musk himself. Uh, secondly, he is strongly alluding to firing someone for having a disability, which is just even more catnip for the employment attorneys who are watching this all unfold. Oh, baby. And thirdly, Elon 
If you're not going to simply check with HR on this guy's employment status, you can at least Google his name because um, doing that would have probably prevented a lot of embarrassment that's about to follow. Yeah, but, uh, you know, when you got those banger tweets locked up in there, that brain, they just got to fire out right there and then. You can't you can't do any kind of research. You got to no. just let the fingers roll. Vibes, baby. So, yeah, this Holly guy, real name Harold Thorlison, was chosen as the 2022 Person of the Year by various media outlets and organizations in his home country of Iceland. He's kind of a national hero. And let's just check on why that might be. Here's the website Iceland Review. Holly, a 45-year-old designer, gained nationwide recognition this year when, after the sale of his tech company Uno to Twitter, he chose to be paid the sale price as wages. Normally, in such large sales, the payment comes in the form of stock or other financial instruments, which categorize the sale as capital gains, meaning it is taxed at a much lower rate. Holly, however, gladly paid the higher tax rate, having spoken publicly on many occasions about the benefits he has received from the Icelandic social system. And it continues, Holly was born with muscular dystrophy and came from a working class background. In statements about his decision to pay back into the Icelandic social system, he cited both healthcare and education in Iceland as keys to his success. Notably, he was one of the highest taxpayers in the nation after the sale of Uno. Since the sale of Uno, Halle has engaged in numerous philanthropic pursuits, earning a reputation as Iceland's benevolent tech titan. One of his best known projects is Ramp Up Iceland, which is building ramps throughout the nation to increase accessibility for people in wheelchairs. He has also personally donated to the legal funds of victims of sexual abuse and has garnered praise for charitable donations to families in need this holiday season. Hmm. Well, what a, what a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. What a, just though, this guy's the worst. Yeah. Uh, on the bright side, though, Elon, you know, to be fair, you got to give Elon credit. Sometimes he didn't go out of his way to call Holly a pedophile. Yeah, he's learning, I guess. He's uh, it took him it took him like five years, but he learned. Well, Elon Don't actually actually P-word. Elon doesn't have uh, a dollar to bet anymore. Yeah, <laughs> so he can't make those kind of accusations. Bet you a signed IOU, <laughs> some some Twitter stock that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Anyways, Holly was pretty calm, patient, and polite through his back and forth with Elon. All things considered, uh, even like the the thing with the NDA and and I think Elon trying to goad him into actually breaking it initially was quickly refuted because Holly was like. Can you please confirm with your lawyers that yeah. I can speak about this? And once you give me actual confirmation that my you know legal rights are protected, then I will talk to you about it. Right. But we are, by the way, sir, doing this in public. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, in a response thread explaining his medical condition and the challenges he's overcome, uh, he continued to be polite while still occasionally throwing in some much-deserved jabs at Elon as a CEO and as a person, like this one. My family is the best. I have two kids. I see them every day. I recommend that. <laughs> Damn. And, and it's only Damn. A, it's only a dig if you are that bad of a parent yeah. in person. Like this is a pretty standard operating uh, kind of way for most people. You would assume uh, as parents to just be like, you know, maybe not focus entirely on work. But uh, seeing your kids sure is great, isn't it, Elon? <laughs> uh, or there's this regarding the company he founded. We grew fast and made money. I think that's what you're referring to when you say independently wealthy, that I independently made my money as opposed to, say, inherited an emerald mine. Uh, uh, yikes. Yeah, that's like Elon Musk accusing someone of being independently wealthy. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Of all the insults, if, if you are Elon Musk, like there's just certain things you don't accuse others of being because... You're Elon Musk. No, he's doing it because it, it it throws doubt on his entire life story. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, then there's his unfiltered assessment of Twitter under Elon Musk. Uh, it's pretty long, but let's read. I joined at a time when the company was growing fast. You kind of did the opposite. There was a lot going on. The company had a fair amount of issues, but then again, most bigger companies do. Or even small companies like Twitter today. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. Are you still reading or is the bathroom break over? What was I saying? Ah, yes. And then you bought the company and told employees you weren't firing 75% of them, which you then did. I wasn't in the first batch or the second or third or fourth. I'm not sure which layoff round I was in. There were so many of them. Each one came after you promised the last one was the final one. During my time at the new Twitter, or 2.0 as you called it, I talked to my manager every week and asked what I should focus on. And then I proceeded to do those things. Every one of them. I also contacted HR regularly and asked if my job description was correct or needed updating. I wanted to make sure I was doing what I was supposed to do. They always said they were looking into it, but I never got a reply. Interesting. Looking into this. (laughs) Concerning. It continues. 
And now finally to my fingers, which I know you have great concern for. Thank you for that, by the way. I'll tell you what I told them. I'm not able to do manual work, which in this case means typing or using a mouse for extended periods of time without my hands starting to cramp. I can, however, write for an hour or two at a time. This wasn't a problem in Twitter 1.0 since I was a senior director and my job was mostly to help teams move forward, give them strategic and tactical guidance. But as I told HR, I'm assuming that's the confidential health information you are sharing, <laughs> uh, I can't work as a hands-on designer for the reasons outlined above. I'm typing this on my phone, by the way. It's easier for because I only need to use one finger. I hope that helps. Let me know if you're going to pay what you owe me. I think you can afford it. Yeah. Anyways, after a couple hours of even Elon's own simps realizing that their space daddy was kind of a bad guy here, yeah. uh, Musk replied to one of them who said that they had worked directly with Halley and was disappointed to see Elon being such a dick to him. Musk wrote, Based on your comment, I just did a video call with Halley to figure out what's real versus what I was told. It's a long story. Better to talk to people than communicate via tweet. <laughs> I would like to apologize to Halley for my misunderstanding of his situation. It was based on things I was told that were untrue, or in some cases true, but not meaningful. He is considering remaining at Twitter. Uh, the last line is odd, but uh, also this is, it is so close to when you see Donald Trump back in the old days, the 2018s, 2019s, when he's president, and just firing off the most insane tweets ever, and then there be and there's just this one that just feels so out of place and odd mm -hmm. because it feels like someone took his phone away and said, "Ah, oh, geez, yeah, uh, we need to legally fix what we what he's done." Yeah. Uh, finally, Elon's lawyers uh, got through to him, and uh, hey, you are you're breaking like multiple employment laws even by like discussing this in the open. You need to just shut the fuck up. Also, this hasn't been confirmed, but uh, there are some theories that. Uh, as part of the deal this guy took with Twitter basically guaranteed uh, employment for a certain period of time and if that was broken he'd get a payout for the lump sum of what he would have been owed for continuing to work there and so like that would cost Twitter potentially I don't know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, which they do absolutely not do not have no. right now. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm sure someone was very frantic, e e even if the numbers are off by whatever. Like it is arguably in the tens of millions of dollars, if not a hundred million dollars. So they're, <laughs> sir, you are making the second biggest financial mistake of your life right now. Yeah. First one being buying this platform. And it's just like, especially it's, so this guy like lost his job, seemingly no one at Twitter like knew that he had lost his job or why he would have lost his job. Certainly mm -hmm. not Elon. Uh, yeah, Twitter bought this company like a year ago and it seems like what they do is probably important mm -hmm. to what Twitter does, but Elon has never fucking heard of this guy. Doesn't know. It, it's just, it, it, even if Elon was 100% like, in the right, even if Halley was being a total dick, it does not reflect well on your like organizational yeah. abilities that you are having this conversation in public like this. But then just, you know, because Elon's Elon, he picks a fight with the guy who made Iceland's businesses accessible to handicapped yeah. people by building Someone ramps. Someone described it as like Elon picking a fight with the Icelandic Mr. Rogers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyways, this has been described as, you know, an apology. Oh, he apologized, so we're all good. And, you know, Elon did use the word apologize. But it's hilarious how much of those tweets is Elon refusing to take accountability here and blaming the whole thing on other people not properly informing him, which might not be true either. Because yeah. if he's not taking the time to even Google this person, he's probably not taking the time to ask those around him. And, yeah. I, and I would venture to say that the ones that are still surrounding him at the company are ones that would... Yeah, he wasn't doing anything, yeah, he Mr. Sucks. Elon. He's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him he's the worst. Yeah. Uh, so the line, better to talk to people than communicate via tweet, is especially rich coming from Elon. Um, zero self-awareness. No. Uh, this whole thing started because Holly exhausted every other option other than communicating via tweet to find out whether or not he still had a job, which is something that does not happen at normal, properly functioning companies whose CEOs actually know what the fuck is going on and don't spend 18 hours a day on social media. Yeah. None in, of this makes you look good. In most cases, just reply guying and posting memes. Yeah, like, it would be one thing... I mean, he does pretend to do work on Twitter, which is always very oh, funny. Oh, jeez, you, you wouldn't understand how brittle this company is. Looking into this, concerning. But, like, yeah, it's mostly just him fucking raffle emoji replying. Yeah, he did one today that was just like, and he keeps doing these sporadically, but it's like, 
Uh, it was like, you know, someone inserting a hate Elon Musk chip into the NPC meme. Yeah. It's just like, sorry, sir, uh, the tide started changing, at least for us, maybe a little bit sooner, but definitely the uh, Vernon Unsworth. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> like, that was pretty and much... And how many years ago that was, was that? That was the turning point. That was like six years ago. But yeah, even before <laughs> that, there was some weird, there was some weirdness there. But it's like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, everyone's just now deciding because the mainstream media told them to that yeah. Elon Musk isn't the coolest guy in the world. It's like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. No. Anyway, even if Twitter 2.0 was doing great, mm -hmm. uh, Elon's comments about Halley would still be wildly unprofessional, but it absolutely is not doing great, neither financially nor functionally. Uh, for one thing, here's this from Reuters. Twitter Inc. reported a drop of about 40% year over year in both revenue and adjusted earnings for the month of December, the Wall Street Journal reported on Friday, citing people familiar with the matter. The report comes after several advertisers slashed their spending on the social media platform after Elon Musk took charge of the company on October 27th, resulting in a 71% drop in advertising spend on Twitter during December, data from advertising research firm Standard Media Index showed. So on the functionality side, Twitter keeps breaking in increasingly weird ways, though there's really nothing weird at all about a website breaking down more often after most of the people who know how to keep it running are no longer working there. On Monday morning, a bunch of things stopped working. For a few hours, links didn't work, tweet deck didn't work, and pictures didn't display. Here's Platformer explaining what happened. The change in question was part of a project to shut down free access to the Twitter API, Platformer can now confirm. On February 1st, the company announced it will no longer support free access to its API, which effectively ended the existence of third-party clients and dramatically limited outside researchers' ability to study the network. The company has been building a new, paid API for developers to work with. But in a sign of just how deep Elon Musk's cuts to the company have been, only one site reliability engineer has been staffed on the project, we are told. On Monday, the engineer made a bad configuration change that basically broke the Twitter API, according to a current employee. The change had cascading consequences inside the company, bringing down much of Twitter's internal tools along with the public-facing APIs. On Slack, engineers responded with variations of crap <laughs> and Twitter is down, the entire thing, as they scrambled to fix the problem. I was just, uh, you know, pulling out how important this could this cornerstone of this building be. Every day I'm going to walk Jenga. in here and pull out one wire and <laughs> yeah. just see what happens. I choose to believe that uh, Mr. Beast contacted him and said, Sir, people are wrecking my displays and posting pictures of it. Can you stop the pictures, yeah. please, sir? Stop the pictures. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of shit that doesn't work, though, uh, a year ago, Twitter launched a version of the site that could be accessed via Tor, a.k.a. the dark web. And they did this in direct response to Russia banning Twitter in the wake of their invasion of Ukraine. This was done to allow Russians to be able to access information about the war that wasn't just state propaganda about how great things were going. And it sounds like exactly the kind of free speech anti-censorship project that Elon Musk would love. But as of this week, the Tor version of Twitter is down due to an expired certificate, probably because whoever was in charge of keeping it running no longer works there. <laughs> and, you know, so far, not a peep from Twitter about fixing this. Yeah, who cares? The entire, like, part of the world uh, I hate on access. You. Yeah. Mm. It's uh, interesting. Concerning. Uh, concerning. It is concerning. Looking into this. But hey, what about that? all the new features that Elon is adding to Twitter to make it so much better than before? Mm -hmm. What about all those? Yeah. Like, over a month ago, he wrote, Starting today, Twitter will share ad revenue with creators for ads that appear in their reply threads. Oh, cool. We're going to start getting paid. So, obviously, this revenue sharing would, of course, only be available to Twitter Blue subscribers who pay $8 a month. And it would be virtually impossible to get back more than $8 or anywhere even close to the $8 you even spent. Even on YouTube, it would be like, yeah. you know, 50,000 views to get $8 or something ridiculous. Yeah, it would be a lot more than that. <laughs> Millions. Anyway, how's that going? Here's The Verge. After a month, it hasn't appeared. Both the Twitter Blue and Twitter Creators accounts have been silent about the feature. It's not mentioned on the Twitter Blue signup page, and Musk doesn't appear to have brought it up since his initial announcement. I also wasn't able to find anybody claiming that they've been making money from the feature. If you or anyone you know has, please reach out. As far as I can tell, the sum total of publicly available info on Twitter Blue's ad revenue sharing is contained within Musk's tweet about its launch. And yeah, there has been a significant increase in, obviously, in ads, but all the ads are so... The weird ones. Terrible. There was one... I get a lot, was, I get a lot of ads for Scientology. Weird. I, uh, there was an ad the other day for, uh, like, someone's Twitch stream, and they were, you know, Twitter Blue verified. They had 100 followers... And the tweet itself had like, you know, 300 views or something like that. But it was a sponsored tweet in the mix of a bunch of other ones. And I was just like, this is so 
strange. Yeah, they they've been jamming sponsored tweets into weird places. Uh, it used to be great. like a year or two ago, Twitter was actually experimenting with paying ad revenue, and they were doing a pretty decent. Were CPM, they? it was just extremely hard to get into. It was for like... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would see it I, only from like the, the few gamers I follow. They would post clips from their streams, but there'd be like a little yeah. ad running at the beginning of it. Mm-hmm. But I, I, in other Elon news, the BBC published an article mainly about how basically no one at Twitter is actually monitoring stuff like targeted harassment, state-sponsored disinformation, or child exploitation content anymore. And how researchers who study these things say they're much worse now than before Elon took over. But the article also provided some insight into the overall situation inside Twitter HQ from an engineer who was quoted anonymously. Here's what he said. For someone on the inside, it's like a building where all the pieces are on fire. When you look at it from the outside, the facade looks fine, but I can see that nothing is working. All the plumbing is broken, all the faucets, everything. A totally new person without the expertise is doing what used to be done by more than 20 people. That leaves room for much more risk, many more possibilities of things that can go wrong. Yeah, sounds about right. Um, and then there's this part, which uh, has a, just a, n- a new new Elon lore just dropped. Yeah. The level of disarray in his view is because Mr. Musk doesn't trust Twitter employees. He describes him bringing in engineers from his other company, electric car manufacturer Tesla, and asking them to evaluate engineers' code over just a few days before deciding who to sack. Code like that would take months to understand, he tells me. He believes this lack of trust is betrayed by the level of security Mr. Musk surrounds himself with. Quote, Wherever he goes in the office, there are at least two bodyguards. Very bulky, tall, Hollywood movie-style bodyguards. Even when he goes to the restroom, he tells me. Which might add to the other dig that Holly said yeah. about him being in the bathroom. That was a, that was a deep cut. Sir, is anyone uh, banging on the door to see yeah. if you're alive right now? But, like, walking around your office, like, I'm, and I'm sure, like, Twitter, the office, despite, like, the fucking copper being stripped from the walls to sell... For scrap, uh, I'm sure you still can't get in without going through some pretty, uh, you know, decent security. So, like, walking around your own office with, like, two bodyguards falling around, like, what are you fucking afraid of? Elon Musk is in his Howard Hughes arc right now. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is insane. (laughs) Like, why do you have two bodyguards following you to the fucking bathroom in your office? I would not be surprised at all if Elon Musk had some piss jars in his office. Yeah. That's, you know... You, to you, that's just piss. To me, that is... Someone's going to try to steal someone's this. Someone's going to steal this piss and they're going to clone me. Yeah. They're going to make evil Elon, which I guess would be good Elon if mm-hmm. we're doing the opposite thing. Yeah. Someone should do that. <laughs> Anyways, if you can believe it, that's not even all the Elon news that we have this week, uh, but let's just get through it so we're not here all day. Mm-hmm. I hate this man. First, uh, the FTC is investigating Elon and Twitter over those Twitter files. Remember those? Uh, which conservatives treated as massive bombshells, despite only really revealing that, uh, yeah, government agencies and officials do in fact maintain lines of communication with major social media networks, and sometimes they ask them to do things. Yeah, this is all common knowledge. Oh my gosh, uh, what? Not shocking to anyone, especially after the multiple exposés written over the past decade at least. Yeah, anyway, these Twitter files involved independent journalists, handpicked by Elon, posting loads of internal communications and data from Twitter, posting it publicly, which... As many pointed out at the time, seemed to be in potential violation of Twitter's 2011 FTC consent decree that was put in place due to egregious mishandling of private data. So Twitter, for the last 11 years and counting, I think they got another nine years left on it, they have to report regularly to the FTC about what they're doing Mm -hmm. to ensure the the safety uh, of private information and... um, so by posting a bunch of internal communications uh, directly on the timeline and get letting, letting random fucking journalists like Barry Weiss and uh, Matt Taibbi just scroll to their heart's content, might, I don't know, might be in violation of that. And the FTC is also concerned about Elon just gutting Twitter staff and the effect that that might have on Twitter's ability to comply with the consent decree. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another government investigation, too, this time an NHTSA investigation of one of Elon's other companies, Tesla, for multiple reports of Tesla Model Y vehicles having their steering wheels fall off while being driven. Oh, oops. Of all the problems the car can have, this one's the funniest. It's also pretty fucking dangerous, but like just the image of driving and like, oh, God, it's like some Charlie Chaplin shit. You don't understand. This makes it more like a cool race car. That's what uh, it's, <laughs> all F1 cars and NASCARs. They can take the wheel off. It's a it's a safety feature so that you can climb out of it when it is driven into a wall and letting itself on fire. 
Yeah. That mm. in the future, all self-driving cars, like the second the self-driving mode turns on, the steering wheel will pop off comically. Yeah, instead of an, be like boink. No, no, no. Instead of an airbag, it develops a steering wheel to claim that you were responsible for the crash. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's also Neuralink. Yet another Elon company is, which is also butting heads with the government, specifically the FDA, who has rejected Neuralink's application to proceed with human trials of Neuralink's brain-computer interface. Oh, jeez. And you know. I don't think that's going to stop them. Deep down in my soul, I don't think that's going to stop them from testing. He's, human... he's got a, a like basement full of simps. Like, Elon, do it. Drill yes. into my head. Yeah. Uh, Trepane he... my skull. Here's Gizmodo on that one. For years, Musk has repeatedly claimed that human trials for his brain-computer interface are right around the corner. In 2019, Musk said his company was angling for FDA approval by the end of 2020. In 2021... The billionaire tweeted that his company might advance to human trials later the same year. In April 2022, Musk reportedly said that Neuralink was hoping to get to its first human implant before 2023, according to Reuters. Most recently, in November 2022, the CEO promised that human testing was only about six months away in an underwhelming Neuralink show-and-tell event. Now it seems the company is set to miss that self-imposed deadline, too. Literally just kicking the can down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't realize he was doing it with Neuralink as much as he does it with Tesla. But um, yeah, the man is, uh, the, the list of uh, unfulfilled promises this man has made mm -hmm. is fucking wild. And like any other person in this position would probably be like, I should probably stop giving firm uh, projections especially for when a, things are going to happen. Especially in a tech company where yeah. like, yeah, you're, it just shows that the company is not operating in the way that it should be if those, uh, you know, predictions were ever made with any kind of like hope in the first place. All right. But when you're Elon Musk, you say something is coming and people treat it like Stock it's go up. treat it like it's already happened. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. But uh, finally, uh, this ought to be good. Mm -hmm. Some interesting news. Um, so Alex Gibney, the award winning documentarian whose previous films have covered Theranos, Scientology, Enron, WikiLeaks, the opioid epidemic, U.S. military torture in the Middle East, and many, many other interesting topics, announced that he is making a documentary about Elon Musk. Hmm. Uh, there's no other details or even a release date, but um, that's definitely something to look forward to. And our sympathies go out to Mr. Gibney for taking on this subject matter and uh, the ways that it will surely ruin his life as it has ruined ours. If you've been through the, uh, you know, the Scientology ringer, uh, there's yeah. not much worse that Elon Simpson He'll could ever be do. fine. He'll yeah. be fine. But it's like, oh, God, like the amount of shit, the amount of files this man is going to have to like just keep track of. Like we at least have the we have the nice benefit of doing it as it uh, comes, <laughs> doing yeah. it as it comes. And then I can I've I've forgotten more about technology than you will ever know, child. <laughs> All right. Uh, boomer. <laughs> uh, Gibney's next project, the Snyderverse. Oh, God. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then, like, this is the Hollywood Reporter, whoever tweeted that out, and Elon was just like, it's going to be a hit piece. And then Alex Gibney responded, he's like, how do you know that? You don't know anything about the project. But it probably will. Also, return my calls. Yeah. Uh, do you want any kind of Literally, narrative like, this, I, like, I, like I keep interview, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting. But, like, sir, your, your entire life narrative that you're currently living through is creating the hit piece. Like, yeah. you're just offering up the content. And it is like, uh, yeah, it is interesting that, you know, just anyone talking about Elon, it's, it's definitely a hit piece. I'm a persecuted man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he has the thinnest skin of anyone and spends all of his time defending himself uh, and, you know, riling up his base of supporters to defend him well, as well. Well, you're going to feel real stupid when we're all living on Mars. With chips in our brains and uh, right. cyber trucks. That's right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Anyways, we do actually have more news to cover today, uh, but first, this episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. We all shop online, we've all seen that promo code field taunting us at checkout, but thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. And if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. We use it all the time. Everything from food delivery to, uh, get, you know, maybe, hey, it's a tech show, some tech products. Yeah. And uh, without fail, you know, at least uh, once or twice, uh, uh, you know, a month when online shopping, you'll save a pretty significant amount of money. I really do. It really does it. add up after a while. And uh, it's a nice surprise to say, 
hey, look, I'm saving a little bit of money. Here. And they do a nice thing where they're like, hey, wait, don't buy it. This was cheaper last week, and it's probably going to be cheaper again. <laughs> You're being manipulated. Yeah. Uh, Honey doesn't just work on desktop. It works on your iPhone, too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. And we re re never recommend something we don't use. So get PayPal Honey for free today at joinhoney.com slash newsday. That is joinhoney.com slash newsday. All right, back to the news now. And we've managed to make it all this way without talking about AI. Oh, God, I completely forgot about the AI. AI, yeah. But here's some AI news. And spoiler alert, it's not good news. Oh. It's actually bad news. Okay. Uh, let's read from the Washington Post. The man calling Ruth Card sounded just like her grandson, Brandon. So when he said he was in jail with no wallet or cell phone and needed cash for bail, Card scrambled to do whatever she could to help. It was definitely this feeling of fear, she said, that we've got to help him right now. Card, 73, and her husband, Greg Grace, 75, dashed to their bank in Regina, Saskatchewan, and withdrew 3,000 Canadian dollars, or 2,207 in U.S. currency, the daily maximum. They hurried to a second branch for more money, but a bank manager pulled them into his office. Another patron had gotten a similar call and learned the eerily accurate voice had been faked, Card recalled the banker saying. The man on the phone probably wasn't their grandson. That's when they realized they'd been duped. We were sucked in, Card said in an interview with the Washington Post. We were convinced that we were talking to Brandon. You know, thank goodness for that bank manager because it's rare to see someone so proactive about these scams and, uh, you know, aware of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, most bankers are trained pretty well on this stuff now. The problem is that the way that, uh, a, a pretty genius part of these scams is uh, the people that they're like, we need the money now, now, now. Uh, they, they're creating a situation that is embarrassing to them. Mm -hmm. Like, you wouldn't tell the banker, I'm withdrawing this money because my son, like, is in, is in prison and I need to bail him out. Like, mm -hmm. that's, it's, you would just be like, no, I really need it. So, uh, the bankers get fewer opportunities to be like, hey, doesn't, uh, we actually see this a lot. You maybe, uh. We've got some some pamphlets for you. You need to learn about all the ways, all the various fucking ways the world is trying to scam you in your twilight years. That's what I'm saying. That's the other thing, too, is like, you know, you hate to say this, but I would say that someone working at a physical bank, probably if an old person is coming in requesting a withdrawal of a large amount of money, at least the slightest red flag goes up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, like, they need to have, like, some form of compulsory... Shut up, uh, ageist. Like counseling is... maybe you know let's let's uh, let's use the term workshop they'll go to a nice workshop put on yeah. by the, the the senior center uh to make everyone aware of these uh, scams it gives them something to do like, once they're done with their shift at walmart local tv news instead of uh you know struggling for content every night should just be a like a free seminar on um all the different scams that are targeting the elderly these days I, I think that th that does happen. It's just that the news comes on at 11 p.m. most of the time. They need to make it earlier. Yeah. Instead of like them just like ch like chit chatting in the morning at six mm -hmm. or seven a.m. where they're talking about like inconsequential bullshit, it should like because no one else is watching at that time. Just be like senior alert. Hello. Yeah. Uh, once you put down your Metamucil, let's talk about the scams that are going on around. AARP here. should be going door to door, just being like, "Ma'am, you look old. There's a few things you should know." Yeah. Here's a here's some. Here's some reading material. Yes. Don't answer the phone ever. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a type of scam that's been around for a while and often does prey on older folks. But the addition of AI generated voice technology makes it even more effective and even more terrifying. It is totally understandable that someone hearing what sounds exactly like the voice of their loved one would believe they, they would believe what they're being told and act accordingly. Uh, in another anecdote from that article, though, another older couple got swindled out of $21,000 thinking their son had killed a diplomat in a car accident and needed the money ASAP for legal fees. And why would they doubt the story? Their son was the one who told them about it. Yeah, I mean, this is especially wild because this is technology that literally did not exist like a year ago, or at least not in an easily accessible way. Yeah, it's, you know... Like, it's not even... like It's not even just old people who are vulnerable to this. It's no, like it's any, everyone. Anyone who's, like, not been paying super close attention to what's been happening with technology and, like, the also, ways that it could be misused. I... Look, I hate to think this way, but it's true. There's probably not going to be a lot of budget at big companies to educate all of their workers on these types of scams because it will cost money to, you know, educate them about this. 
uh, it's it just sucks. It's like, you know, you get the good with the bad. You get scams on the elderly, but at the same time, you get Joe Biden talking about seeds and stems. That's right. And that video is, games. <laughs> I watch that clip like once a day. It's the best. <laughs> I watch the one with it. It's a... Uh, Trump and Biden playing uh, Overwatch together, and it's I mean, very there's, funny. There's a bunch of those. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but so yeah, this this shit's all terrifying. Everyone really ought to sit down their older relatives and explain to them gently. Yes, the myriad ways that they are at risk of being scammed over the phone. Uh, some of which probably still sound like science fiction due to the speed at which scam technology is progressing. Mm -hmm. You got to get a code word for your. Yeah, nowadays safe words in the bedroom passe. Safe words with the parents. That's the new thing. Yeah. You got to call up and be like, uh, you know, purple avocado, monkey, purple monkey dishwasher. <laughs> Hello. Oh. The narwhal bacon's at midnight. <laughs> Hello, fellow runner. <laughs> Hello, fellow family member. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. It's there. There is that with like, you know, banks and stuff like that where you have yeah. a code word. So you might need to have one with, if your parents get past a certain age. I've noticed my bank has gotten a lot more aggressive. Like anytime I need like two factor authentication or something, there's like before I even get like uh, a code number or something. It's just this like paragraph of just like, please do not. We fall will. For we will never ask you for this code. Uh, yeah. Uh, just like all the things, we will literally never do this. If someone does this, it's not a. Yeah. Uh, but uh, speaking of AI, here's some more fun AI news. Uh, Americans love to point out. Hey, look over. It's China. Look at the look at these totalitarians <laughs> in China. They're using facial recognition in all their mass surveillance. Everyone's just being followed around. Uh, so Social dy credit so dystopian. And... It's like George Orwin's 1986. <laughs> um, and I mean, that's all like yeah. true. Like, but you know, turns out, would it shock you to learn that our own government has been working on pretty much the exact same thing for at least the past decade? Uh, <laughs> anyway, here's the Washington Post. The FBI and the Defense Department were actively involved in research and development of facial recognition software that they hoped could be used to identify people from video footage captured by street cameras and flying drones, according to thousands of pages of internal documents that provide new details about the government's ambitions to build out a powerful tool for advanced surveillance. The documents, revealed in response to an ongoing Freedom of Information Act lawsuit the American Civil Liberties Union filed against the FBI, show how closely FBI and defense officials worked with academic researchers to refine artificial intelligence techniques that could help in the identification or tracking of Americans without their awareness or consent. It continues, many of the records relate to the Janus Program, a project funded by the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency, or IARPA, the high-level research arm of the U.S. intelligence community, modeled after the Pentagon's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as DARPA. Program leaders worked with FBI scientists and some of the nation's leading computer vision experts to design and test software that would quickly and accurately process the truly unconstrained face imagery recorded by surveillance cameras in public places, including subway stations and street corners, according to the documents which the ACLU shared with the Washington Post. And the article goes into a lot more detail on all this, with one of the more chilling details being an FBI scientist saying, some of the biggest enablers of better face recognition include cell phones with cameras and social media. Okay, so they're uh, Yikes. they're hijacking our cameras and they're uh, they're scrubbing our social media and just downloading every picture. Yeah, cool. They're, so they're doing what that private company. Uh, now, yeah, was that the was one already that uh, doing. was uh, uh, claiming uh, people like it was specifically Black Americans? Uh, were coming up as like the police were using their program to identify them and it was yeah. all inaccurate. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, God, like the LAPD, like multiple police agencies have used similar technology. It's like it always, it just does not know what uh, black or brown people look like. Mm -hmm. It just cannot, It it's built on bad uh, source data white people yeah. pretty much exclusively so it just thinks all black people and brown people even twitter went through this with the uh, yeah. that whole and scandal like, that was, uh, and so yeah. yeah it's not a useful tool and the end result is really just like hassling people in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods it's virtual stop and frisk and so it's bad that's bad enough but like even if it did work this is just not information anyone who cares about privacy should want the government to fucking be keeping track of anyways yeah uh, yeah, Democratic Senator Ed Markey responded to this news pretty much immediately with a new Senate bill seeking to ban federal agencies from using facial recognition technology. And it has received support from Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Rashida Tlaib, among many others. But multiple previous legislative efforts to ban or limit this technology have failed to pass. So don't get too excited about yeah. that. 
Also, Bernie has a new book out. It's called It's Okay to Be Angry at Capitalism. And it's, it's okay to be angry at capitalism. And it's uh, the audio book is narr- narrated by him. So it's uh, and it's uh, quite good and very uh, engaging because he's the one reading it. So it's good. Uh, anyways, finally, here's some other tech legislation news. Our previous president very famously tried to ban TikTok nationally and failed at it, but he didn't end up selling it to Walmart like we had all hoped. Yeah. Uh, but apparently our current president is also looking to ban American teenagers' favorite app and might actually pull it off. Oh, yay. Just when we... Uh... Just when he needs the support of younger <laughs> Americans to, uh, you know... Uh, Great timing. For a very uh, ill-conceived uh, presidential re-election which I don't think, in my opinion, he should be doing, but, uh, you know, whatever. I think he, he was fine with TikTok until he saw all those fucking Overwatch edits. He's like, oh, yeah, no. I've never played Overwatch. Shut it down. <laughs> I would never be a Mercy main. Uh, anyways, a new bill making its way through Congress called the Deterring America's Technological Adversaries Act doesn't single out TikTok specifically, but does allow the Secretary of Commerce to ban foreign technologies and companies from operating in the U.S. if they present a threat to national security. I mean, I'd say most tech companies present a threat to national security, but that's just my very wide interpretation. A lot of people get caught up in this. Uh, Uh, But yeah, Biden himself apparently was involved in drafting the bill. And this is pretty much the closest thing to a bipartisan issue that exists in Congress right now. Everyone wants that damn TikTok off Americans' phones. They do hate it. For national security reasons or for personal reasons. My damn son won't even talk to me. Won't even talk to me at dinner. Um, so yeah, it seems like it could definitely pass, uh, unless Republicans decide they don't want Biden getting credit for something that Trump tried to do first, which I would not put past them. Mark Zuckerberg is rock hard at this decision. Like, oh, oh finally, Instagram Reels is going to have its day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, but yeah, it would be a big fucking deal to ban one of the most popular apps in existence, not only for how much it would piss off China and lead us ever closer to fucking World War III, but uh, also how much it would piss off America's teenagers, who've had it hard enough as it is, and who we kind of need to vote. Yeah, we do. They've been doing a good job so far, um, but who knows? But yeah, under 18s, they can't vote. Well, so not yet, yeah. they don't matter. But um, there's a, a good portion of them that will be able to in time for the next presidential election. Um, but yeah, uh, TikTok on the chopping block once again. And I'll say it, I, I fucking hate, I haven't had the app on my phone for years now. Uh, I dropped, well, I guess, I don't know, a year or two, maybe. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it is, it's mind garbage. Uh, it really is. And it's like, its biggest strengths are also its biggest problems. Like, it's like, okay, the Chinese surveillance shit or whatever. Like, my biggest problems with it are that it's like rotting people's brains with its algorithm, which probably almost certainly is violating people's privacy in order to oh, and, like, be so successful. There's definitely like each person has a case file of sure. everything. And, and yeah. as someone with like full on fucking ADHD, that app was a nightmare because I would yeah. not be able to get off of it. it. It is it was a physical reaction that I just had to keep scrolling. And But I mean, also, like if TikTok goes away, like Instagram or whatever is going to do the same. No, that's fucking that's thing. good old fashioned American yeah. uh, intelligence. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess we'll see how that goes. TikTok, uh, enjoy your... Keep scrolling. Look at that for you page while you can. Yeah. But uh, that's our show today. Yeah, in case you missed it, uh, we got uh, the the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory version, but Mr. Beast is Willy Wonka, and, you know, he doesn't have Oompa Loompas yet, but they're pretty close. They are stands. And uh, so if you want to see see that and including some uh, some coverage of CPAC, we have that over there. Also, the the downfall and the criminal charges against one of the most entertaining media scams yeah. to appear uh, in recent years a, on a, Weekly a, Weird. A, a, a classic all-time grift, Aussie media. Uh, so check out Weekly Weird News for that. Yeah, it's, check out both of those. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Let's get this video 40,000 likes. Let's get it 40,000 likes. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.